some facts about this. I think China at this point of time is leading this. Uh, China, the Chinese uh, central bank is right about uh, starting their local currency. Apparently they haven't started it yet, but what we all know is that they should start it in a couple of months with this. They are a little bit ahead of uh, Europe and of course the US. Um, but of course the European Central Bank is also experimenting in this field. Deutsche Bundesbank is also experimenting in this field since uh, three years. Commerzbank is doing a lot of projects in this field. We have startups in this field, so this uh, uh, topic is growing. And interestingly, uh, you have basically, um, let's call it a joint movement in this direction also by politics. So we have uh, the Bankenverband in Germany, the German Association of Banks pushing this topic. We have the Bundeskanzleramt pushing it. We also have the board uh, of the Deutsche Bundesbank uh, pushing it and various associations here in Germany also calling for the digital euro. So that's interesting to see that this topic is basically pushed. To be very honest, I think we need more energy, more budget, more people uh, doing this uh, and also more understanding. And that's why we decided to have um, the digital Europe as a topic for this panel discussion for today. To get um, started, I will quickly show um, an overview picture which we have drafted um, at the blockchain center last week. I think this is important to really know what we are talking about. Um, I hope you can see this slide. What you see now here is on the very top that we will in the future have uh, so-called programmable money. This is not just the digital euro, it's more than that because the digital euro is just there for assigning money uh, to the owner. Programmable money uh, is going much further because you then can also program money uh, such that uh, smart contracts can be executed uh, with the euro inside. Then on the left hand side, you have central bank digital currencies, uh, the abbreviation which typically is used CBDC. And there you have wholesale CBDCs which will be used for interbank and security settlement. Then you have retail CBDC that's for us as end users, private users, companies, public authorities. That's like the online banking account we all use today. And in the future, potentially, we might also have some kind of machine CBDC when the IoT, Internet of Things uh, and machine economy, economy is coming in a couple of years. Then most interestingly and most discussed these days are the so-called retail CBDCs. This can be split uh, according to the BIS uh, in the direct model <clears throat> where we as human beings and as companies directly have an account uh, with the central bank, but it's unlikely that we will have this model coming to us. Then on the other hand side, you have the indirect model where we have basically uh, as our contractual party, the classical bank, Sparkasse and so on, um, who is basically providing the digital hero to us. And there is an interesting hybrid model where the bank is basically not in charge of providing us with the euro, but at least they are administering the system. As a with bank, I now mean like commercial banks uh, and so on. That's the CBDC uh, path, uh, which is basically initiated by the central bank. That's on the left-hand side. But there are also other possible ways of uh, programmable money development. That's on the right-hand side. And here you see, for example, um, that private organizations can also issue money, not necessarily currencies, but money. The difference with a currency, we typically mean uh, traditional currencies such as the euro, the US dollar and so on. But money goes a little bit further. Money can also be a mode of exchange, which is not uh, provided by the government. That's, for example, the MakerDAO project DAI, but this could potentially also be the Libra coin and so on. So therefore, it's written here that private organizations can issue money, not necessarily a currency. And now it gets interesting, <clears throat> and this is what we will talk about, because currencies can now issued by a regulated entity. This could be a commercial bank or e-money. This is apparently exactly what the uh, Deutsche Bundesbank um, is um, not really promoting, but at least they would not have a problem with it if companies or banks are issuing regulated uh, entity in terms of commercial bank money. Um, but you would also on the right hand side uh, issue currencies or money as an unregulated entity. That's the so-called private stable coins where also the Ministry of Finance uh, in Berlin has some problems with. That's private stable coins backed by currencies um, where you have like a very, very huge counterparty risk. Then also you have private stable coins backed by crypto assets. That would be the MakerDAO, Project DAI potential uh, private stable coins backed by a currency basket, algorithmic stable coins, and so on. This goes on. But I think that's a very good overview such that we know what we are talking about today. And I think today we are discussing um, on, the, on these uh, seven rectangles on the lower uh, part, we are discussing the left 
four, I would say so, especially the one in the middle where currencies are issued by a regulated entity. So I now stop this. I just uh, thought about providing this chart as an overview to uh, have it very clear what we are talking about. So sorry for this lengthy uh, introduction. I would now hand over to uh, each of the panel discussants, Benjamin, uh, Martin, um, uh, Thomas, and Max, um, such that they can very quickly present themselves, uh, what they are doing, what they are working on, and also to really get to know their perspective. Who wants to start? Benjamin Duvel from Commerce Bank. I'm the head of custody and direct market access. So I take care of uh, safekeeping of uh, our institutional clients' assets, as well as execution their, uh, executing their orders on German and international exchanges and settling it into our, uh, into our custody world. Why I'm uh, a lot in touch with, uh, with all the digital assets, the aspects of uh, money we're talking now on chain and all these because uh, Commerce Bank has been very active in this space already since I think the first trade we did in the securities world was 2017 where we um, did our first um, um, Schulschein uh, settlement on chain. We went on from there from issuing to uh, issuing under German jurisdiction where you have to issue that the underlying security usually is not dematerialized um, through going to in different legal frameworks where we could actually issue a token with a dematerialized security. We uh, use stable coins, for example, even though they're called different by Eurex to uh, simulate an on-chain DVP or to actually do an on-chain DVP uh, settlement. And uh, have now gone through the whole value chain. So basically, secondary trade issuing settlement using different forms of uh, of money on chain to work through all the aspects we think are most important in the securities world. So that's uh, where I come from. Beyond that, Commerce Bank is very active in that space with different partners in different um, different um, models. So we, for example, also go ahead and uh, have a, e uh, a payments use case with Daimler where we use or e-money license to uh, go ahead and facilitate the micro automated micro payments. In this case, uh, it was for a, for a truck. Um, we look into further applications of that currently, though nothing is uh, is uh, um, public yet. And um, we have all this range of different topics because it used to be, uh, we still have a mine incubator and used to be one of the main focuses of our mine incubator. But since we think the technology is maturing, um, the majority of staff has now joined uh, Commerce Bank and uh, you can be uh, quite hopeful, as I am as well as an enthusiast, of course, that Commerce Bank will soon roll out actual market uh, infrastructure or implementation of DLT or blockchain technology. Very interesting. What, what does soon mean, Benjamin? Can't tell. Okay. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Okay. Who wants to quickly present uh, uh, his viewpoint uh, next? Uh, Thomas, maybe? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Thomas Nagel. I'm an attorney from Liechtenstein. Uh, I was uh, part of the work group uh, of the Liechtenstein government uh, drafting the Liechtenstein Blockchain Act, which might some of you already know. Um, I'm a former coder, so um, I, I've I tried to build that bridge between technology and, and law. And uh, so I, I, I mean, we, we as a firm, we advised quite some, some projects uh, the last years. And we saw everything from uh, the question when you do your fundraising campaign back in the old days, uh, for example, an ICO, if you would allow investors to use fiat uh, to invest and how complicated it was to accept fiat currency uh, to invest uh, or to buy uh, back then utility token. Uh, but uh, now we see a lot of financial intermediaries thinking of issuing their own uh, um, coins, which might be e-money. Uh, others uh, think of have, uh, issuing stable coins, private institution. Therefore, I really like your overview, Philip. That was, that was very good that you have like the big picture. Um, 
And my opinion on that is actually, uh, and yes, we see all of these central banks now uh, talking about the project. And I think we need not all of them, but most of them we will need. So we'll need e-money issued by, uh, let's say, banks. Uh, you see that in, in Switzerland already happening. Uh, you need central bank money as well in a, in a digital accessible way, for sure. Um, and the question is, um, I think that we will need uh, also some some uh, private institutions issuing uh, digital money or whatever you want to call it. Perfect. Um, who wants to quickly present himself next? Maybe um, uh, Martin Diehl from Deutsche Bundesbank. Yeah, thank you very much. So my name is Martin Diehl. I work in the Deutsche Bundesbank, uh, heading a little group uh, doing analysis in payment and settlement system. And uh, we have been focusing on Bitcoin and uh, DLT now for a couple of years already in the time when people believed in that community that the uh, central bank would vanish. Now we are talking about a digital euro, as you have heard. So times have changed, as you can see. Um, we focused from the very beginning in our, uh, in our attention to those so-called currencies that money always needs trust. And we believe that central banks will have to play a role in that. Um, as for the question whether we need central bank money, uh, we were never that sure about uh, most trades nowadays are settled in commercial bank money. And we still believe that this could hold for the future as well, uh, that we will settle trades in commercial bank money, in digital commercial bank money. Uh, there might be cases where central bank money could be used, but I don't think it is necessarily so. In addition, we feel that some of the risks of issuing central bank, digital central bank money are not well understood by now. Uh, nevertheless, we are part in many working groups discussing those issues, also doing some experiments to find out more about it, how we could use it. I think uh, we should all should change our attention from purely digital to programmable money. What we really, what we think we need is programmable money for making DLT work, to make the money lack of DLT work, making it work fast. Um, what we work at the moment, one, one project we work at the moment is thinking about how we could connect DLT to commercial no, sorry, to conventional payment system, uh, such that the money lag would be settled separately. In a, if we could do that within a few seconds, we don't need tokenized money on the ledger, uh, at least for many of the trades involved. But this is still, we are not the only one thinking about that, but uh, I think it is one aspect we will see in the future, uh, whether we will see digital central bank money, I'm not so sure about. Perfect. Um, that's interesting to really prom promoting commercial uh, bank money, not necessarily CBDC. Um, but promoting is maybe a little bit too much, but at least you are, um, uh, there would be an um, objection um, concerning this. Okay, Max Forster, maybe you would also uh, take the mic and present yourself quickly. Yes, <clears throat> obviously. Thanks for the introduction, Philip. Uh, first of all, to myself, as the company might not be known to all of you uh, so far, um, my name is Max Foster. I'm co-founder of Cash and Ledger. Uh, previously, I was working in the management consultancy space for two major management consultancies, um, as well as being exposed to the venture capital industry. So I've also been uh, having some roles there. Um, next to co-founding Cash and Ledger, I'm also the co-founder of Blockchain Buy and Evolve, which is a local association in Bavaria. As well as the and as well as I'm a member of Bitcom, um, particularly for the blockchain working group, as well as like an <clears throat> advisor to the Economic Council of Wirtschaftsrat CDU, um, particularly on topics such as CBDC, as well as like you know, future payment methods and the fintech working cycle in general. Um, enough about me. Uh, what do we do at Cash and Letter? Cash and Letter is a company initially initiated in Spain. We brought the euro on blockchain on the just uh, actually mentioned commercial money level. So um, we actually have the mission to bridge the financial services with um, existing financial services ecosystem 
with the future uh, block, the world of blockchain and DLT. We hence uh, use the e-money directive, uh, which was brought up by the European uh, Central Bank as well as the Commission, and um, do that together with um, the Spanish partners. In that sense, we uh, scope to bring that whole uh, thing to Germany as well. We conducted several POCs uh, from a variety of industries. One of them is, as we just mentioned, because we love also to distinguish between online payments and digital money and programmable money, because programmable money will enable the future. So one of our distinct use cases is the automated machine billing based on the program of the euro, as well as delivery versus payment issues, which we just meant I heard from Benjamin as well. So um, this is where we're currently based on. We see, um, or we brought a solution on commercial money level um, for the statement, but um, whether it's in the future CBDC, which is then interoperable uh, between all the banks and we have an interbank clearing standard, or it still stays on commercial money level that only one single bank can do this in isolation. That's the point for after discussion. What we see currently is that <clears throat> with the advancement of private stable coins and uh, private uh, issued stable coins such as Libra or other uh, initiations, there will money will be will become competitive, and hence there might be a solution at least for interbank clearing to enable a programmable money standard for the entire region of Europe. Otherwise, as Philip as you mentioned, China will lead on that topic and uh, future business models and also talent as well as like startups will move over to China in order to receive their business model. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks much. I think that was uh, very good as an introduction. We talked uh, already about um, multiple variants of uh, the digital euro, but I think we should uh, uh, follow Mr. Deal in the sense that we should more focus on the programmable uh, money part because this is basically the beauty of uh, DLT and blockchain. But now let's come to the uh, point um, why actually do we need um, cash on ledger? Why do we need euro on blockchain? Why do we need programmable, programmable money at all? So, what are interesting use cases here? Maybe uh, Benjamin, you would like to start um, what you find most interesting use cases where the digital euro makes sense. As you said, there are two, two, important, uh, two important aspects in, in, in the whole structure. It's the securities world. So we don't talk about the old world, but let's talk about the new world. Once you have digital assets, um, you don't want to introduce new risks to that infrastructure by not having a T2S-like uh, settlement. Meaning, nowadays, when you buy a security as a bank, we would be able to give your money to the central bank, more or less, and the central bank will get another person to give a security, and then there will be a handover of money and security at the, at the central bank uh, level or the T2S level, meaning no risk, no counterparty risk. So all the things you talk about in blockchain would not be there because you have the most entrusted party in the whole system, at least, um, guaranteeing that nothing goes wrong with that. So that's DVP. If we talk about digital assets and we don't want to introduce new risks in that space, we need some mechanism or some way and central bank money on chain would be one of those solutions to enable risk-free delivery versus payment of digital tokens against money across many different counterparties. I think uh, it was mentioned before, uh, interoperability, of course, is one of the, the, the big topics here, but in general is risk reduction in the whole uh, ecosystem or the digital assets ecosystem the same way we have it now in the traditional securities world. So that's one of the very important aspects we came across when doing all our different uh, our different topics in, in, the, in the blockchain token area. Um, tokenization, that's a legal framework. You have to look in it. Uh, some regulation needs to be amended, but that's quite manageable. But handing over inter-organizationally a token to another organization and get something back and be sure that in that split second, um, and that's what we bankers always have to look at, that split seconds, the system goes down and the other bank is not there anymore. Um, that's really is an issue and it becomes an issue when you talk about large scale transactions. So hundreds of millions moving back and forth um, and uh, you have that counterparty risk. So I think that's the main aspect from my uh, securities world. And that's where I'm very interested to understand what, uh, what Mr. Deal uh, thinks about that aspect, because that's the, the aspect for me when we talk about truly digital assets. 
in the payments world, I'm I'm always a little bit um, a little bit torn. I think the e-money, programmable money, it's very good for micro payments, for automated payments. But I'm not expert. I can just tell you what I see, and it's of course all my private opinion. Um, I see programmable micro payments. Those are issues which are very important. I think for organizations to nowadays not do a cash pooling across a big organization and by that manage your money, but do constant micro payments to settle every account in split seconds could be very interesting. If at the point of sale, it's relevant when we see what the uh, credit cards can deliver nowadays. And I think everybody has seen the incredible numbers we had just one day before everybody knew, the, knew there will be a shutdown. The amount of transactions which can happen and can be settled in the traditional systems is so big. I'm not sure if that part of the of the equation is interesting. And then we talk about programmable money, interoperability. That's very important aspects. And um, I think there are other aspects to better talk to that. But I think that's a little bit my way. Don't try to replace everything with that. But look at the use cases where you really can use the new technology. Yeah, uh, Max, maybe a question to you. What are other use cases in the area um, in the non-financial area, what about uh, what we typically hear, future mobility, supply chain management, logistics, industry 4.0, you know, this is also huge. And uh, why would the digital or programmable euro be used there? Yes, um, thanks for that. So I think like... Uh, what... Oh, there is some audio uh, issue. Can you speak up? It was better for, uh, previously. Yes. Does, yeah, it, no, does it work better now? Yeah. Sorry for that. Hamburg doesn't have, like, I think the best internet connection right now. <laughs> so sorry for that. Um, yeah, so, uh, so thank you, Philip. Um, I think what we need as generically, generically speaking, need to do is like not do the same like processes and just use a blockchain on it. So I think we entirely need to think like new business models. And uh, as you said, one of them is definitely like in the machine industry. So what does blockchain enable here is basically like, you know, a machine paper use case. Meaning like, you know, diving a little bit into that topic is like so far you only have like, you know, the uh, possibility to not even flexibly finance machines, but um, you can, you only can either like lease a machine or you can buy a machine. So basically finance it. The point is that if you could enable like a dynamic leasing model where the user only pays whenever he consumes parts of the machine or whenever he is actually only turning the machine on, this would actually like um, basically enable new kind of business models on top of that. So basically increasing costs, um, as well as, you know, in terms of the, um, the customer, as well as, you know, enable a new business model for the machine producer and manufacturer in a generic sense. In fact, we're currently working on exactly that case. Why does a blockchain help here? I mean, it's not specifically addressed between like the buyer and the seller in an initial sense, but um, you actually have one single source of data. And this data is basically the machine data usage. And this machine data usage must also be answered uh, in a fully fledged business model by other parties. Meaning that if you have an insurance company, like, you know, securing the cash, cash counterparty risk, or if you have like a financial services provider or like a, um, basically another kind of um, supplier for the machines themselves, all of them basically need to rely on, up on the same data stream. And if you have the same data stream, you could either design a centralized uh, basically database focusing on the part that you actually, um, yeah, give different kind of or complex user access rights, or you put that on a decentralized version or at least like a distributed version where you use blockchain technology and then also have the settlements via blockchain technology and hence by tokens. Having said all of that, basically what I wanted to show is like you need to actually have new business models and this actually can also be derived in various other cases. So for example, um, cross-border payments as you just heard, is one of them which uh, there can be like you know huge um, process efficiencies being gained by actually using DLT based money as well as if you have for example like um, the factoring processes they can also use uh, blockchain DLT in a sense that you also need always like the delivery versus payment aspect in that sense so um, as we said Philip there is a variety of industries being leveraged so far we are working particularly in the mechanic engineering space we are slowly diving into the automotive space as well. There's uh, several use cases without saying too much, obviously. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, there is definitely some use case in the automotive industry. And I think it's actually time also like to literally focus on all the other industries where it's everything will be connected in the entire like ball game to money. 
because if you want to leverage all the blockchain PCs from all enterprises out there, and if you literally want to like bring the smart contracts and this triggered process efficiencies to life, everything like once it's boiled down, once it boils down, everything will actually boil down to um, the part that you need to your own blockchain because you need actually to have cash settlements. Okay. Um, what is uh, what is the question about um, the commercial bank bank money you are using? Apparently, you are not using CBDC because you're using commercial bank money, but you're not having an own uh, e-money license, right? So, how is this working, and uh, how do you make this work? I mean, basically, what you do there is uh, we are working together with uh, partners, banking partners, uh, particularly right now in Spain. We actually want to bring that to Germany as well. Spain was just the first uh, starting point because um, yeah, we got approached in Spain first. Hence, uh, we established a system where we are counted as an IT outsourcing provider, what you call in German law. In Spanish law, it's a little bit different, but what you be called in the German law is IT outsourcing provider. And we actually like defining the e-money standard using, therefore, right now, an Ethereum-based version, ERC 2020 or EIP 2020 currently, which is serving as an e-money standard. And uh, this basically is then the token, which can be uh, derived from an um, account or deck which can be used in the blockchain space. Generally speaking, like a process for the end user will actually only be, uh, they open up a normal bank account. This bank account is then interlinked with a blockchain wallet. So you basically have a one-to-one -one API relationship between the Ivan and the blockchain wallet, meaning that whenever you basically send money to your new bank account via normal SIPA transfer, this money is accredited and stored in the Ivan, frozen in the Ivan, and you actually get like the e-money in the form of blockchain tokens in your wallet and then can use this money interoperable on any kind of blockchain POC you want to use it. And you basically build the bridge as said before between the blockchain DLT world and on the other hand, like, you know, basically the, um, the world of uh, banking. And this is also what we mean with the commercial money aspect because what you ultimately do is basically just within one institution, you're giving out electronic money which can be redeemed and issued only at the same institution again. And this is what we do with the e-money, um, yeah, with the e-money directive, together with partners, particularly in Spain, but uh, hopefully also uh, next time in Europe, like uh, in Germany. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, what exactly is e-money. Uh, e it's a, a term everybody talks about, but it's not easy to understand. Maybe Thomas, uh, you are the lawyer here in this room. Uh, what is exactly e-money? How can it be used? And most interestingly, uh, Liechtenstein is, uh, I would guess so, from the legal framework, uh, two or three years ahead of other countries with their blockchain approaches. Um, are companies discovering this such that they are applying for e-money licenses in Liechtenstein? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and maybe let me start with uh, the problems we all have. Um, and we, we see that here as well. Uh, we, we, we use new terms and everybody's using it differently. Uh, so we talk now about programmable money versus digital money versus, uh, um, I, I might call it digital fiat money, uh, central bank issued digital currencies. Um, and there's no uh, clear legal definition of all of these terms. And the problem is if we have discussions, uh, uh, we, we have to have a, a common understanding on what we are talking about. And uh, therefore, I'm coming back to your slide again in, in the beginning, um, uh, that, that we, we have to have like the big picture, uh, what we are talking about. And e-money is, is a clearly legally defined uh, regime uh, within the European Union. So it's not uh, something uh, which you can use globally from a, from a legal perspective. I mean, you can use it, but uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, the same standard or might not be the same standard. Um, and uh, the problem there, we, we have like, since years, we have a lot of discussions with regulators because even within the European Union, besides the fact that it should be clearly defined, we have different understandings. Um, and th that makes it so hard to use it uh, and uh, to to really like have these projects out there. We 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 do see. I mean, we have Max here <clears throat> that 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 you see already uh, ditched uh, e-money in in a tokenized way, and there is no clear standard. So there's no uh, you have to use this or that technology to issue e-money. It's uh, technologically neutral. It's coming out of a time where we talked about like these magnetic cards where you can have like stored value on it. So th like this legislation is coming from that time. And now we want to use uh, 
blockchain, DLT, whatever technology to issue this digital or e-money uh, in a digital way. Um, so the question is how you can do that. And uh, uh, that's not simple. And with every level, and that's why I said, I don't know uh, if we need all of the digital monies we talked about, uh, but I'm pretty sure we need more than one because we have several standards uh, and the idea is that we, and that's my point of view, uh, it, it's, it's all about digitalization. And I think, so yes, there's, there are use cases in payments where you clearly want to have a standard which is used there, uh, which might not have this uh, uh, like demand for a lot of transactions. Uh, there are others where you have like demand for a lot of transactions um, and, uh, but, but less security. Uh, and so we need not one global standard, I think. I mean, that would be very nice, but I, I don't think we will uh, be able to go there in, in, in short terms. Um, we need several approaches, I think, because there's no, like, there's no technology which fits all needs at the moment. So if you use, for example, a, a, a permission blockchain uh, versus a, a permissionless blockchain, the, we all know what the problems are in this and that respect. So coming back to e-money, what is e-money? E-money is actually, um, uh, as, as we already heard, uh, based on the e-money regime in the European Union, uh, it's a one to it, it's a it's a digital money you issue, uh, uh, which uh, you, you get the claim for the same amount in fiat. So if I have a uh, let's say a, a, a digital uh, euro e-money token, it's worth one euro, and I can back to the issuing party and hopefully uh, get back. And why it's hopefully, because there's, there's a lot of regulation around it, what you have to do as, a, as an institution, uh, uh, that you don't have this counterparty or that you lower the counterparty risk against the e-money institution. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very, very, I, I think it's a, it's a very complex topic. And I think, yes, we do see already, um, not only Liechtenstein, but in other uh, uh, European jurisdictions, uh, that companies are issuing e-money based on these technologies. And uh, uh, to uh, try to answer your question, Philip, if that's something uh, which we discussed in Liechtenstein, we did that quite intensely because um, um, we, we thought about this token economy of the future, and we said, okay, um, you, you need, uh, in, and this depends again. For, for the use case, if you talk about the securities world, yes, you need delivery versus payment. Um, and uh, what's the beauty of this technology that you might not need a, a central counterparty anymore, uh, a CCP. I mean, uh, based on the regulation we have so far, you still need it. Uh, but from a technological point of view, uh, you can address this counterparty risk, uh, risk by technology only if you have a digital fiat money. Um, I if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, are you at, the, at your law firm processing e-money applications? Or yes. maybe this is also confidential? Uh, no, I mean, that, that we are, that's all, also public information. So some clients uh, um, announce that publicly, that we help them uh, applying for these licenses. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, maybe a question um, towards uh, Martin Diehl from the, from the Bundesbank. So you, on behalf of your institution would not have uh, any reasons against uh, private banks uh, doing the digital euro with an e-money uh, framework apparently that's what you have said but maybe you could explore this a little bit um, in more detail also the question what would you think why are companies not doing this yet first of all uh, let me make sure most of the money used today is commercial bank money banks issue money that's what they do that what they what they have earned a lot of money on also um, what technique they use is not our business we do oversight on that we make sure that it's safe and uh, also a little bit efficient but uh, uh, mainly we don't care for their technique why don't banks do that at the moment there are two problems one problem is uh, the question of solvency. If I issue a token which bears a claim on my institution, if I were a private bank, a commercial bank, then this token always represents a claim on my bank. So if we transfer that token, the 
the receiver, the seller of a good, would receive a claim on this commercial bank. Nowadays, without, uh, without having digital money, it is different. If you receive money from a counterpart, it is transferred to your bank account, to your bank account with your bank, so you have a claim on your bank. In the future, if you transfer a token, you might receive a claim on the bank of the buyer, the other bank, so you don't want that. Maybe the risk is too high, you don't know that bank. So there's a problem, of course, if we have commercial bank issuing a lot of different tokens, like a Sparkasse token, a Genossenschaftsbank token, and a Commerzbank token, there would we would need some clearing. That what we do today with commercial bank claims, we clear them, we settle them. I could think of that, but this would need a new system, and it would need a new standardized form. That's the second problem. We need standards to do that. Those tokens, commercial bank tokens, need to have a legal, a technical, and also an economical standard, what they mean, what they represent. This requires some coordination. Of course, public hand could help a bit in overcoming this coordination problem, but we could not issue them. What we could do is maybe issuing central bank money, but we are not the issuer of commercial bank money. This standardization is a problem because it should not be only in, in Germany, it should be at least the European standard, maybe worldwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, to agree on that, you know how difficult it is. We have to bring ideas for JP Morgan and the Santander and Commerzbank uh, under one hat and to discuss it. Um, this should be, this would be basically a problem, but I think it could be overcome maybe with a little bit help of uh, the public hand, maybe the central bank, to create this standard and to make digital commercial bank money work. Mm -hmm. But um, you talked about JP Morgan, uh, what they would do is actually again commercial bank money on uh, on a blockchain system, I would guess so, right? Everybody talks about JP Morgan, but apparently there is not much out there, expect some press releases, uh, or am I wrong? You know, uh, maybe in case uh, everybody here in the room is knowing more, please let me know, but everybody talks about JP Morgan, but not much is happening there, apparently. I have one thing you say, commercial bank money, they issue a token based on commercial bank money. There's an additional layer, I think uh, uh, Thomas mentioned that earlier, there's an additional layer of risk in there because something you have in your bank account is regulated and differently treated um, also in a default scenario and all of those others because there's certain insurance schemes and so on based on what you have in your bank accounts compared to e-money and the claim you receive through e-money or other kind of stable coins or anything by institutions. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. So I think the rollout problem of all of that is without the central bank, without any of the, because I see also the questions on the side here, without any of the known players in the system who regulate and are at least in Europe, it's a central bank and, and the Bundesbank in charge of mon monetary policy issuing money, if they are not involved, you roll out a system where you introduce to everybody involved an additional layer of risk. And I think from a macroeconomic point of view, that's not something we should aspire to. We should try to minimize the risk or have the same level of risk you nowadays have for the money you have in the bank account. Yeah, but not Which, by the way, the I bank account is interoperability. Yeah. It's the bank account these days, right? I, I don't really believe this, this risk argument because we all are using Apple Pay, we are using PayPal, we're using all kinds of banks. There is some counterparty risk involved and it does work. So therefore that uh, the risk is basically higher with commercial bank money. I don't really believe this, but but maybe maybe Martin Deal, uh, another question. There's an insurance on it. Yeah. Bundeswehr, sorry for the Bundesbank. <laughs> um, when do you expect uh, things to happen? Uh, when, when do we see um, more projects of this kind? At this point of time, we just see very valid experiments, but uh, when would you expect to see more? You know, will it take months or will it take uh, years? Um, the Christi Christine Lagarde from the ECB tells us that we should stay ahead of the curve, but actually this is this cannot be true because we are not ahead of the curve. China is ahead of the curve, uh, to be very honest. Uh, so therefore, you know, what, what would you expect in terms of milestones for the next month or years? 
this is very hard to say uh, because most of the project have been delayed again and again. Uh, also about China, we, we do not have really inside knowledge. We have talked to them, of course, on a, on a central bank level, uh, on working level and also on, on governor's level. Uh, there is not much more disclosed than has been disclosed to the public. And the last thing I heard is, well, within a few months, we will be ready. But this was um, more than half a year ago. Sure. Uh, the same with Sweden, the e-corona project. Uh, I, I uh, pointed from the very beginning when that speech was uh, made by the uh, vice governor, where they announced for the first time the e-corona, I think it was uh, two or three years ago in, uh, in December. And uh, in the very last paragraph of the speech, uh, it was said, this project might be the most difficult project we have ever undertaken in the Swedish Reichsbank. And I said, well, this is correct, but unfortunately, most people don't read the speech to the very end. And uh, <laughs> that's why we see those big problems. I mean, they keep mm -hmm. announcing, they, I think they keep progressing, but it is not tricky. That's what we, it is not easy. That's what we said from the very beginning. There are a lot of technical questions. There are a lot of economical questions. What will be the, let, let me, let me, that's the stage. Where are we? Well, we, in, within the Euro system, we have a high level task force on, on uh, a board members level discussing uh, mainly real tail CDBC, what are the risks, what could be, how could it be implemented, what could be technical features we need to implement. Uh, this is not an experiment, there is no technic technician involved, no coding done and so on. Just a discussion on a conceptual level, very fruitful discussion. The same is happening on a global level among the big central banks uh, in the world. The euro system is involved, of course. Uh, we discuss what it could be. I think, let's think in a step-by-step -step approach, what could be a potential next step from central bank side, um, an easier step than retail central bank money is wholesale central bank money, a wholesale token. Uh, facilitating uh, what Benjamin has talked about, uh, security settlement, making it faster, uh, speeder, but only being available for those who have already access to central bank money. Why could this be uh, a next step? Because it is much easier to implement. There's much less involved operational, uh, much less risk involved, operational risk or economical risk, uh, because we know those actors. It will be a limited group. And... Uh, it will be from an operational point of view, not that demanding as retail central bank, uh, digital central bank money will be. Another next step could be what we call the so-called trigger solution. A trigger from a DLT settlement to conventional payment system. This is something we put some hope in, in the Bundesbank. If we provide a solution where you do a DLT settlement, and the DLT settlement in the smart contract is halted for five seconds and triggers the payment via target two in central bank money. And the wholesale would be settled, the money lag would be done via target two, then a token comes back, the token which entails the confirmation by the Bundesbank, this uh, money has been transferred, and then the whole uh, settlement is uh, fulfilled by the smart contract. If we could provide that, it would at least do the trick for a lot of trade. It would not do the trick for those immediate machine-to-machine uh, -machine payments, you know, where the car is standing at the traffic light and get some, uh, some new energy, <laughs> where you immediately need a coin. This, therefore, we would need definitely a coin, a token, a maybe commercial bank uh, money token. But a trigger solution <clears throat> to target two could be for security, the solution. And wholesale CBDC could be a next step, but I wouldn't expect it to happen within, within a year. It would at least, at least take two years, it, my, my guess, but I don't know really. Interesting. Interesting. I've never heard about this, uh, that, uh, the, that you're thinking of building such a bridge between legacy systems and modern DLT systems. Are you, I, maybe you don't want to answer this, but are you operatively working on this or is it still PowerPoint mode? 
well, we, we have been talking about that in, in uh, public life at, at a very conceptual level. Uh, of course, we also start doing more than con concepts about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm typically asking the question, what is, what is a company or an organization doing? Coding or PowerPoint? Because that's basically the difference, uh, what actually comes out. But it's, it's, it's amazing that uh, Bundesbank is pushing this. That's, that's really good. Yeah, we have um, um, like two, three questions uh, from the audience coming up. Uh, in case there are more questions, please post them in the chat box. Um, one question would be now, and I think this is really crucial, what happens if there is a bug in the code, uh, smart contracts, locking in some money. Of course, we need some auditing. This is pretty clear. Uh, but uh, who wants to basically answer uh, in the panel the question, what happens um, if bugs are in the co code? Or how can we like guarantee audited code such that money is not lost, such that no hackers can intrude systems and so on? Who would like to take this question? I mean, oh, OK. <laughs> OK, again, uh, Mr. <laughs> and, then, and then Max uh, afterwards. Well, very short answer. That is one of the reasons why we always believe that only permissioned blockchains are the solution for the financial industry. We need someone to administer and someone to, uh, to take uh, responsibility for the governance of the whole system. It, it, for central bank money, it should be the central bank and they should take care of it. Okay. Yeah. As a banker, I can fully agree uh, on that. In my personal opinion, that's exactly what... Uh, what we as a bank would expect and where we feel most comfortable as having that central instance where you can go back and don't have the old school problems you had in the, in the blockchain space where you suddenly have to uh, start a new chain uh, to undo mistakes in an un, 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 unwindable smart contract, for example. But sorry, Max, I think it was your... No, no worries. I think uh, I can also fully agree with that statement. I think if you have a look at like uh, the commercial bank integration with you feel currently is that uh, essentially that point like you need to have like um, a connection between a central part of the solution as well as like a distributed part of the solution. We see essentially like, you know, particularly in the financial services industry, Corda as one of and as well as private Ethereum clients as one of the like, you know, more particularly uh, involved technologies. For the very reason that you know uh, all of it is going to be regulated and audited so even if you have like you know a smart contract which is not fully deployable you at least have somebody you can talk to because your money will always be backed by the bank so you know the money you will be given out in form of e-money is always backed at the bank meaning that whenever there's some money lost and you know as particularly saying in the distributed systems like all of the participants are going to be listed because you need to have a kyc and aml process beforehand so you know all of the participants in the system Hence, um, having said that, like, you know, the database structure and the connection between, like, you know, the tokenization part on the e-money level, as well as, you know, the smart contract, which is then deployed, decentralized, with distributed in a distributed manner, like the money directly will be stored in the blockchain wallet, which are one-to-one -one backed by the IBAN. Having said that, like, no money will be lost in that sense, because if there is falsified transactions, you can basically reverse them by, like, you know, the centralized entity. And like, you know, ultimately by the bank being involved in all process. Okay, interesting. There's a follow-up question. Uh, would standardization of smart contracts, uh, would standardization of smart contracts be the, um, the solution to the problem, for example, with regard to bugs and uh, auditing? You still have bugs, right? I mean, if, if, this, if the standard, it's even worse, right? If you have a standard contract and that has a bug, the, 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 the outfall from that would be even larger because, uh, or if you have these, you put in a code now and hope your smart contract with that bug you can exploit um, will have 100,000 instances running, it's even worse. So I don't think that's it. I think I fully agree with, with, with Max uh, that the central, some kind of a central counterparty or some kind of a central authority who can unwind undo or change certain aspects is needed and i think um, as a bank we always look uh, of course as a, at the permissioned um, part when issuing for example or looking into issuing digital assets and others to secure that perfect i think this was a very nice uh, closing word uh, the time has already been ended i actually i learned a lot uh, thank you very much for your contribution